So <clears throat> there are two other forms I want to talk about that will traditionally go with the listing agreement that you need to understand and think about when you're dealing with this. The first one that I want to talk about is the residential seller's disclosure form. All right. The residential seller's disclosure form is required in the transfer of real property within the state of Indiana. All right. So it must be passed from the seller to the buyer. They are the ones that's required to sign this. Now, everybody that's on the listing agreement is also going to be the, the signator of the residential seller's disclosure form. So it's not going to be you, it's going to be the seller, all right? This is something you don't fill out, this is something they fill out. Now, there's always this question about who signs it and who's liable for it? Well, the reality is there is a specific group of people that are exempt from the seller's disclosure form, all right? So let's talk about who is exempt from the seller's disclosure form. Um, <clears throat> transfers ordered by a court, that's the easy one. Anytime the court orders the property transferred, like as an estate or in the foreclosure or a bankruptcy, or imminent domain, or the divorce decree, there is no seller's disclosure required when the court forces that sale or that transfer of the real property. If a mortgagee, remember that's the bank, who acquired the property through a foreclosure, then subsequently sell it, they are also exempt. So bank-owned homes are exempt from the seller's disclosure. Whether, <clears throat> whether they took it through a foreclosure or it was actually given to them as a deed in lieu, both of those are exempt when the bank sells it. We already mentioned the decedent's estate. If they are the executor or the guardian of a person, Transfers made from one owner to another co-owner, like in a divorce decree, if a husband and wife split the house and one quit claims his interest to the other, there is no seller's disclosure there. The same thing if a spouse transfers it to what's called consanguinity, which is the descent, like their children, if the, a lineal line of consanguinity, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correct, you may want to check with your attorney on that. So that will uh, allow you, there is no requirement there. So if you, you know, quit claim it to your children. If you failed to pay any of your taxes, if your property is taken from you for fail to pay taxes, if it's transferred to any other governmental entity, like through an imminent domain lawsuit. That would be one where there's no seller's disclosure. And virtually the last one is the first sale by a new build. If you remember, that comes in at the uh, certificate of occupancy, which is required from the builder to the first buyer. So the easiest way to look at this is if it's a court order, if it's transferred between co-owners or family members, if it's taken by the government, or it's the first sale. So all of those can sum be summarized by those four or five different types of people. Now, I know a lot of times you hear this thing, well, the investor landlord doesn't have to because he didn't live in it. That is not true at all. The fact that you didn't live in it, but you were the owner is irrelevant. You still would find, sell, fill out that seller's disclosure. Only those people are the ones that are exempt, okay? <clears throat> is this form legally binding? The answer is no, it's not. It's not legally binding. It's not used to represent a home inspection. It's not used to represent a warranty. It is merely there to transfer what I would call tribal knowledge from a seller to a buyer 
so that the buyer has some inkling of the condition of the property. Now, under the new purchase agreement rules, remember, anything that is now disclosed to the buyer prior to him making an offer is not liable to be the subject of a reason for the buyer to get out of the deal. So if the seller tells the buyer, hey, the roof is bad, and it's got 27 layers on it, and the buyer still makes an offer anyway, the buyer cannot use that information as a reason to get out because it was disclosed to them. So it is not liable because it's based upon what's called actual knowledge. So the seller can always say, well, I, did, I, you know, I thought it was a brand new roof. So what happens if there is an error? If there is an error and it is changed and the seller says, oops, I checked the wrong box. I meant to check this. Therefore, he has changed the seller's disclosure. The buyer is allowed two days to get out of the deal with no repercussions, meaning the seller cannot keep the earnest money in that situation because in theory, think back to the word contract where I told you you're not allowed to lie or commit fraud to get someone into the deal. Well, if you said, hey, the roof's good and the buyer makes an offer and you go, oh, just kidding, the roof's really bad and let me change the disclosure, the buyer's going to say, well, I would not have entered into this contract had you given me the truth. Therefore, I get to get out of it with no repercussions because I entered into it falsely. So if the seller changes the seller's disclosure, the buyer can actually get out of the purchase agreement within two days of the change so because of the actual definition of a contract. Now remember in the signing or the chain of custody, this is actually completed as part of the listing. So what happens is the seller will sign this at the time of listing and then most agents will now upload it in a PDF document to the document section of your MLS and therefore the buyer can pull it down and look at the seller's disclosure prior to writing the offer. And then when the selling agent helps the buyer write the offer, the buyer will then sign the seller's disclosure acknowledging that he did in fact see it and on our purchase agreement, there is a checkbox that says buyer has or has not or not applicable seen the seller's disclosure. So then the signed confirmation would go back to the seller as one of the documents when you write an offer. So the reality is you're going to send an offer back and you're going to sign the buyer's signed copy of the seller's disclosure saying that the buyer did in fact see the seller's disclosure. And then at closing, if you're on the buyer's side of the table, you are going to want the seller to sign the disclosure one more time at closing saying that nothing has changed from the day of the listing and the day we wrote the offer to the day of closing. Remember, there could be anywhere from 10 to 30 to 40 days between there. So the seller has to reconfirm that nothing has changed with the condition of the house at the closing table. All right. So that's a second form that we're going to be adding in there is this residential seller's disclosure. All right, now there is another form, a third form called the lead-based paint form or the lead-based paint disclosure. It is actually the only federal disclosure form that we have. If the house was built in 1978 or prior, you should emblazon this date upon your brain because it is required that this lead-based paint form be submitted to the 
buyer. Now here's a case, <clears throat> excuse me, of where a bank may not be required to submit the seller's disclosure, but they are in fact still required to submit the lead-based paint form. So I want to look at the lead-based paint form real quick so that we could see this because it's kind of ironic that this lead-based paint form right here actually does not say there is no lead-based paint. Notice that these two numbers or these two conditions here say known or no knowledge. It does not say that there is no lead-based paint. They actually will say, it's kind of like a court. You're either guilty or not guilty. They don't find you innocent, all right? So we either have knowledge, which would be A1, or we have no knowledge. Now this particular one that I've got here is from my personal file, and this deals with landlords because we have a property management and if you'll notice, it says lessor instead of seller right here, all right? Same form that works for both buyers and sellers as it does for landlords and tenants. They just sw swap out the words, all right? Now, th notice the second section says either the lessor, which would be the seller, or has uh, provided all of the records, or has no records. Either way, it does not say <clears throat> that there are no records. Either I don't have any, or I've provided some for you. So notice that A1 and 2 and B1 and 2 typically would go together. You know, they would say, hey, the lessor or the seller has no knowledge, which would be A2. Dink and has no records. Now, if they do have knowledge and records, then obviously you must disclose that, okay? <clears throat> and then there is a C portion of this that says that all the copies of the records will be submitted to the buyer. Letter D says that they, the lessee, which would be the buyer, has received copies of the HUD form called Protect Your Family from Lead and Home. Now, there's one other requirement in here for a buyer. And remember that the buyer has a 10-day window to check for lead. Or he can, he can do that, or he can waive it. So in the buyer form, there is a, a third uh, letter E that says that the buyer wants to exercise his right to test the property. He has 10 days or he can waive the right as the buyer. All right. Now, because this is one of the few laws where ignorance is bliss, it is not required for the seller to know. As you can tell, we have no knowledge. Because of that, we have to allow the buyer to understand his rights, and therefore he has that 10-day window. So the buyer <clears throat> has a 10-day window <clears throat> to check the property, all right? This is actually one of the few documents where the agent actually goes on record and initials right here, all right? to show that the seller, that the agent has done his job and telling the buyer his responsibilities, okay? Then like the seller's disclosure form, it is actually signed by the seller when it's filled out, section A and B, and then given to the buyer so that the buyer can actually use it to make his decision when he decides to write an offer. So this would as well go with the offer. So now as a selling agent working with the buyer, you are going to submit an offer. You are going to submit the buyer signed residential seller's disclosure form.
And you're also going to sign the buyer signed lead based paint form and give all three of those back to the seller as part of the offer so that the seller sees the offer, the seller sees the fact the buyer saw the disclosure and the lead based paint form. All right. So those are the three documents that a buyer is typically going to give back to the seller when writing this first offer. All right. We're going to catch up and talk about some more here in just a few minutes.